Hello, it is wonderful to be with you again in our random series. And if you happen to miss last week, this is a series where we're going to be taking verses, the verses from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, and we're going to put those verses to the test. Well, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> Let's go ahead and look at what 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 has to say. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If all scripture is God-breathed, if all scripture is in fact useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness, if every verse will do this, so that we might be thoroughly equipped for every good work, then what that must mean is that I could randomly select any verse and find this to be true. Um, and so what this random series is all about is we're taking 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, and we're seeing, is this actually true? Just so I don't influence the results, because that'd be really easy. I could pick a lot of like, popular, famous verses like we had in our series not too long ago, the Favorite 15 series. I could pick one of those verses and be like, yeah, see how, how Scripture is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness? And you'd go, yeah, but what about some of these obscure verses? So I didn't want to influence this series. I wanted to go and have a random verse generator select it for me. So that's what I did. I found a website that would do that for us. And so last week, it selected Revelation chapter 20. Now, today, it is going to be in Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1. So random. Revelation and Nehemiah. Nehemiah is in the Old Testament. And so let's take a look at this verse that the random generator has selected. Nehemiah 5, 1 says, Then there arose a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brothers, the Jews. Now, if ever there was a seemingly random verse that looks like it has absolutely nothing to do with our lives, Nehemiah 5.1 is one of those verses, which is perfect. It really, truly does fit this series. It really puts to the test, does second, is 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 correct, in that I could look at any place in Scripture and, and have it be used in the way that 2 Timothy 3 says. And so I want to look at what is happening here in Nehemiah chapter 5. Uh, but first we need to ask, what is going on in the book of Nehemiah in order for us to understand what the application is to our lives? So uh, real quickly, we can discover that Nehemiah is in fact the book found in the Old Testament of the Bible. You don't have to be a scholar to discover this. So we know right away that this has happened after Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah is written after Moses has received the law based upon the timeline and, uh, and given the law to the Israelites, meaning that the people that lived in Nehemiah's day are living their lives under the Mosaic law. Um, now, this story is a true story. It happened, and you can see it in history, archaeological records and things of that nature. And we know that this time period of Nehemiah was from 445 B.C. to 430 B.C. While the Jews had returned from exile and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. The book itself is based on this first-person memoir that uh, may have been combined with the book of Ezra around 400 BC. And it primarily revolves around the effort of this guy, Nehemiah. He's a Jewish exile serving as a cupbearer to the Persian king, Artaxerxes I. And he's going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and he restores the city after the Babylonian exile. So I want to get started with verse, uh, well, I want to get started earlier in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. I want to start there. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and distress. The walls of Jerusalem are broken. 
They're broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. You see, it had been a long time since they had left their city and he wants to know the condition of it. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. We have the human response to the news, this troubling news that reaches Nehemiah. For some days I mourned and fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven, Nehemiah chapter one, verses one through four. So we have troubling news has hit Nehemiah's life. And so what does Nehemiah do? That's what I want to know. Because this speaks to me on so many levels. Because we have, uh, when, when news is troubling, it's usually unexpected when it comes to us in our lives. And he receives this troubling news. And so what he does is he prays. And he starts his prayer off like this in verse 5. Then I prayed this prayer. And I love the fact that Nehemiah records what he prayed. So we don't have to wonder and guess. He says, Lord, God of heaven, you are the great and powerful God. You are the God who keeps his agreement of love with the people who love you and obey your commandments. You don't have to look only to the new covenant to discover that God is a covenant-keeping God. Every single covenant that he has made, he has kept. We have the Adamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant. Every single covenant God is faithful to. And so in the New Testament, we have passages like Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, and also 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. And believers are reminded that God's promises, they find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Through Christ Christ. God has established a new covenant, not based on the Mosaic law, but on grace and redemption through faith. In the old covenant, the covenant that these people were living under, there were curses to those who did not observe God's commands. And so that's why Nehemiah says this in verse 7. He says, we have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and the laws that you gave your servant Moses. He's acknowledging the reason we are where we are is because we did not uphold our end of the bargain. Remember the instruction that you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. And so God is true to his word. If you are unfaithful, Israel, you will be scattered among the nations. And this is where they find themselves. But there's a but, and I love this, because Nehemiah is saying, you did what you would promised you'd do. What Nehemiah knows is, though, although we have faithless moments, God always remains true to his word. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself, 2 Timothy 2.13. So because Nehemiah knows God is faithful to his word, he says this in his prayer. He says, but if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. And where did he choose to have uh, be the dwelling place for his name? Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah has some hope. And he has some excitement because he knows God keeps his word. We were, we were disobedient. We were unfaithful. And so you kept your word. You scattered us. But you also said that you would, if we return to you, that you would gather us from wherever we we're taken captive to. And you will bring us back to the place that you have chosen as to the dwelling place for your name. And so the news came. God's people had been scattered. Nehemiah knows why they failed to keep God's commands. But Nehemiah also knows the additional promises that God made that he would gather them back together. And so there's great hope to be had. There's great hope in the promises God has made because they are true and he's faithful to his word. And you can bank on that. You can stake your life on that. And so when we, pl- when we pray, are we allowing God's promise that he's made in his word to ignite our hearts with this great hope for the very things that God has promised he would do? And I hope that this is really resonating, resonating with you in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, to see how this is speaking to our lives and how this is training us, uh, into, training us in righteousness and equipping us for every good work even in the book of Nehemiah, even in Nehemiah 5.1, and we'll get there in a minute. 
But Nehemiah, upon hearing about this devastated state of Jerusalem, he mourns and he prays to God. He asks God for guidance and favor before the Persian king Artaxerxes I in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. God will then go on to answer Nehemiah's prayer, and he permits Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem and to oversee the whole entire rebuilding process. And upon arriving in Jerusalem, Nehemiah faces severe opposition from neighboring enemies such as Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, who try to hinder his efforts to rebuild the city. But despite these challenges, Nehemiah organizes the people and he successfully rebuilds the city walls in a remarkable 52 days. Additionally, Nehemiah works to address social injustices among the Jewish people, including economic exploitation and the neglect of the poor. He also will go on to lead the spiritual revival of the people, including the reading and the teaching of the law of Moses. He brings it back. However, Nehemiah encounters internal strife as well, which he confronts and he works to rectify. He institutes reforms to restore proper worship practices and adherence to the covenant that they had with God. In the end, we have Nehemiah successfully establishing Jerusalem as this great fortified city once again, and the people have their commitment to God renewed into following God's laws. The book concludes with Nehemiah's prayer for God's favor and the remembrance for his efforts in rebuilding Jerusalem. What a book Nehemiah is. But now we have, now that we've had this overview of what the book in the history is here, we really need to go back to Nehemiah 5.1 and seek what is it that we can gain from those moments in time that happened almost 450 years before the word became flesh, Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us. So Nehemiah 5.1 once again says that, Then there arose a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brothers, the Jews. As we keep reading, the reason for the outcry becomes clear. Nehemiah 5.2 says, Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others are saying, we've had to borrow money to pay the king's taxes on our fields and vineyards. The text continues with more issues. But to summarize it all, the cause of the outcry of the people in verse 1 is due to a severe economic crisis and social injustice that's happening within the Jewish community in Jerusalem at that time. Specifically, we have the people facing a famine and they are unable to provide food for themselves and their families. As a result, they had to mortgage their fields, uh, they had to mortgage their vineyards, their homes, and anything they could do in order to buy food to feed their families. Additionally, some had to borrow money to pay the king's tax, leading to their children being enslaved as collateral. Now this situation's horrible, and what's happened is it's caused significant distress and an outcry among the people prompting Nehemiah to have to take action to address this injustice and alleviate the suffering of his fellow Jews. I mean, can you imagine that? They were slaves. They, they, they get this awesome word that Nehemiah is rebuilding the city and, and God is gathering all his people together and you get there and you just start to get settled. You just start to feel really good because the walls are rebuilt and you're safe in your homeland once again and then you face a severe famine and you can't even afford to feed your family. So what can we take from Nehemiah chapter five, verse one? And there's so much there, um, and I could even go off on certain tangents and talk about how you know following God's lead doesn't always mean smooth sailing. Sometimes we'll face one hardship after another, but God will do something good out of that. In fact, we're gonna see the good that Nehemiah is gonna do uh, coming up here in, in chapter five and how it really set the groundwork for him to reform and to put some things in place to really take care of God's people. And had it not been for that hardship, those things would not have been put in place. But is there any training in righteousness that we can find in Nehemiah 5.1 in the history of the Israelites? And I say, yes, the resounding yes, there is. 
New Covenant believers can draw several lessons from Nehemiah 5.1, which ties into 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Uh, to begin with, how about concern for social injustice? You have the outcry of the people is highlighted in Nehemiah 5.1, and the importance there is in addressing social injustices within the community. Similarly, us in the New Covenant, we are called to advocate for justice and mercy particularly for the marginalized and the vulnerable members of our society. This is the heart of God. Just as the people in Nehemiah's time faced hardship and cried out for relief, Jesus demonstrated solidarity with the suffering and the marginalized during his earthly ministry. He showed compassion towards the poor, the oppressed, he, um, and the marginalized, and he emphasized the importance of caring for those in need. So we have verses like Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 19 that show that. And we also have James, his half-brother of Jesus, would write this. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world, James 1, 27. Are we called to help meet physical needs? Absolutely, as a church, yes, we are. We are called to address social injustices. But Nehemiah is not just about addressing social injustices. He was focused on bringing the Israelites back to God. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 8, he does this by restoring them back to covenant with God. In fact, it's different for us in the new covenant because we are given the ministry of reconciliation that we would pronounce Christ as the reconciler between mankind and God the Father. And so the only way for us to be restored in relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. Uh, and the sacrifice he made for us. And so we have this glorious mission to go into the world and to meet people's needs. That can open the door. We can provide food for those that don't have food. We can dig wells for those that don't have water. We can go and, and respond in hurricane situations where, where houses are, are, are completely destroyed and, and all these various things that are awesome and good. But we don't stop there as the church. We bring the good news of Jesus Christ so that there might be spiritual salvation as well. That we might bring people into covenant with God, the new covenant, through Jesus Christ. And so look to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to see exactly this beautiful ministry that's been entrusted to us. And so what good is it to feed a man for a day and allow him to continue ahead without the salvation of the Lord? The way to make a lasting impact when it comes to social injustices is to bring the gospel to people whose lives will forever be changed because of it. Change the hearts of the people and the way people treat one another will forever change. You see, if somebody is treating someone, uh, someone horribly and they don't know the Lord, well, uh, uh, a, a new life, a brand new heart to have the life of Christ will alter that person forever and the way that they begin to see other people will change too. So while Nehemiah's efforts provided temporary relief and restoration for the Jewish community, Jesus, he offers the ultimate solution to humanity's spiritual and social brokenness. Through his death on the cross, Jesus atoned for our sins, he's reconciled humanity back to God offers us forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life to all who believe in him. John chapter 3, verse 16. So I want to share a story about a British orthopedic surgeon who, was dedicate, who dedicated his life to treating patients with leprosy. His name is Dr. Paul Brand. This was in the mid-20th century. He worked primarily in India, and he would later do his work in the United States. But Dr. Brand's approach to treating lep uh, patients with leprosy was revolutionary at the time because he didn't just focus on medical care, but he also addressed the social stigma and the spiritual isolation that was associated with the disease. Leprosy was not just a physical affliction, but it also carried severe social and spiritual implications in many cultures. 
We had those who were afflicted with leprosy were ostracized from the communities because it was contagious and nobody wanted to catch it. In fact, they considered people that had leprosy cursed by the gods. And so we would not want to associate with somebody who had leprosy. But Dr. Brand transformed the lives of countless individuals of, of, that were affected by leprosy. And I love when you go to the stories in the gospel about when Jesus encountered people with leprosy. He actually touched them and healed them. Something that would not be permitted by the law, something that was not even thinkable because it was contagious. But when you have the life, uh, who Jesus is the life, come into someone's world, he can restore and he can heal and he brings wholeness. That's exactly what Jesus did when he encountered the lepers. And so Dr. Brand, inspired by what Jesus Christ did, uh, he, he, he did many wonderful things for people that were uh, in the, the people that were dealing with leprosy. First, he developed surgical procedures to repair the damaged nerves and restore function to their limbs. That's important. He enabled patients to regain mobility and independence. Additionally, he worked tirelessly to change the societal attitudes towards leprosy. He advocated for the rights and the dignity of those affected by this disease. Beyond this medical work, Dr. Brand also saw his role as an opportunity to share the love and the hope of Jesus Christ with his patients. He believed that true healing encompassed not just physical restoration, but also spiritual renewal. And I get, I get inspired when I read Nehemiah chapter 5 because I see the exact same thing. You have Dr. Brand sharing the gospel with his patients, ministering to their spiritual needs as well as their physical ailments. So it wasn't an either or, it was a both and. He would treat their physical needs, but he would also address their spiritual needs as well. And through his compassionate care and faithful witness, we have Dr. Paul Brand exemplifying the principles of meeting physical needs and also spiritual needs as he shared the gospel. And so his life and his work, they serve as this powerful testament to the transformed power of love, compassion, and faith in bringing healing and wholeness to those in need. There's more that we gain from Nehemiah 5.1. We started with the concern for social injustice, but we also see the responsibility that we have for fellow believers. Nehemiah's response to the outcry demonstrates a sense of responsibility and care for his fellow Jews. New Covenant believers are encouraged to support and care for one another within the body of Christ, demonstrating the love and compassion in times of need. We have verses like Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, that says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. And I love Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. And of course, we are getting closer and closer to the rapture, so we should be meeting all the time, and we should really be encouraging one another in the faith. And then a 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 through 18. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Nehemiah served as a shepherd and provider for the people, leading them out of crisis into a place of safety and provision. Likewise, Jesus is described as our good shepherd. And uh, he is the one who's laid down his life for his sheep, John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus provides for our needs. He guides us through life's challenges, and he offers us the abundant life that is found in him. And so this really speaks to me. Before taking action, we see what Nehemiah did. He responded in prayer to a situation that was difficult. He prayed to God and he asked God for guidance and wisdom. And so there's a lesson to be learned there. New Testament believers can follow this example by seeking God's direction through prayer. 
and especially when we're facing difficult situations. And it's one thing to know what God's word says, and that is powerful and important, and to know his, his promises he's made and to stand firm on those things and to know that he's faithful and true to his word, but also to know, God, is this where you're leading me? Is this what you're directing me to do? I mean, we can quote verse after verse, but we also have to move in, in step with his timing because God might be delaying something that's wonderful because in his delay, it's setting something up even better. And I always go to this example, but Acts chapter 16 is, is such a powerful example to me when Paul was prevented from preaching the gospel in an area. And it was because another area needed Paul. He didn't know about this. And in fact, God would send Peter to that region first because God knew that Peter would be more effective at reaching this group of people while Paul would be more effective at reaching that group of people. So delays can be divine and we should celebrate that and we should seek God's guidance in everything. And, and, and I love James 1.5. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. What peace that we can have in knowing that God has all the wisdom, and if we will bring our situation to him, he will reveal those next steps to us. So I just loved our time together in the book of Nehemiah. For me, it was easy to see that in even obscure verses like Nehemiah 5.1, that 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 is true. There's so much we gained in this one verse that applies to our lives in Christ. As we explored, Nehemiah's response to the outcry of his fellow, fellow Jews teaches us valuable lessons about compassion, justice, responsibility, and prayerful dependence on God's wisdom. While addressing social injustice and meeting physical needs are a vital aspect of our Christian witness, Nehemiah's ultimate goal was to lead the people back to covenant relationship with God. Likewise, as New Covenant believers, our primary mission is to bring the lost back to relationship with God through Jesus Christ, whose sacrifice removes our sins and reconciles us to the Father. And just as Nehemiah's prayerful response to the crisis in Jerusalem led to the restoration of his people, so too can our reliance on God's word and prayer lead to a transformation in our lives and in our communities. And I say amen to that. So with that good word, let's conclude our time together in prayer. The first thing that Nehemiah did. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is, uh, is a, it just guides us and it shows us the beauty of your son, what has been made available to us. So the very first thing that Nehemiah did when he had a troubling situation is he brought his prayer to you. And Lord, that really speaks to us. And so as our online audience is listening to this message and they're thinking about maybe some things, some news, some things that have happened in their life, lives that could be troubling, may they bring those things to you and have just such a joy to know that you hear them when they pray, that they have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that their prayers are powerful and effective. In fact, may they share them with other believers in Christ so they could pray for them too, knowing just how powerful that is. And to know that if they lack wisdom in some area in their life, you are faithful to give it to them. And so, Lord, you will give it to them. And I thank you for that. So may they be inspired right now to lift up those things that they need in prayer to you. And if they lack wisdom, may they ask and may they know that you will provide an answer and you will guide them in their lives. So we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise in Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.